<clears throat> All right, thanks, Mark. Let's get started. So today we're going to talk about build, building resilient data pipelines in Go and how we wrote one originally in Java and ended up rewriting it in Go and the results that we had with that. So a little bit who I am, uh, software engineer at GE Digital uh, from San Francisco. I run a Go user group at my company uh, as well. And when I'm not writing or talking about Go, I'm usually outside climbing or mountaineering. So, so what we'll cover today, um, just a little bit about industrial IoT and data and the kind of data that we're dealing with and the motivation behind building this data pipeline in Go. Uh, then we'll talk a little bit about data pipelines, a little sample, and then we'll talk about resiliency testing that data pipeline. So the first thing we're going to talk about real quickly is the data that G's uh, working with and why we kind of built this. So who here has owned a G fridge, light bulb, or microwave in the crowd? And yeah, most people. OK, there's some people. Um, so most people know GE as this kind of like, uh, basically, we build these kind of things. That's what people see us as. But actually, we build huge industrial assets. And these have a ton of data, things like jet engines, wind turbines, and trains. So each of these, they have petabytes of data coming in. So after a plane lands, there's about a couple of terabytes per plane landing. Um, so that's quite a bit, right? So uh, a little bit of fun facts. So G powers roughly 33% of the world's electricity. Every two seconds, aircraft uh, powered by G takes off. So that's two terabytes of data every two seconds. Um, and then there's 35,000 wind turbines globally. Um, and then, yeah, so what we call this is the industrial internet of things. So basically, uh, it's really valuable to get insights into all of these, uh, into all this data. So small increases of efficiency, we're talking like 1% uh, can save millions, if not billions of dollars. So that's why we have all this data in our platform. And I'm going to talk to you about today about that data pipeline that uh, parses a lot of that data. Um, and what we call our platform is called Predix. Um, it's built on a couple different cloud platforms, but we also have a private cloud offering as well. Um, some of our customers, so a lot of the G businesses, but also people like Schindler, so Elevators, uh, Exelon, uh, Rosneft, BP, gas companies. So. so this is kind of what the architecture looks like for our data pipeline and our monitoring and diagnostic service. So. You have customer apps. You have a, like an edge device that's ingesting all this data. Maybe it's a jet engine or a wind turbine. That all goes to our cloud gateway written in Go, which then publishes to Kafka. And then we have a pipeline, which is mainly what we're going to talk about today. And that subscribes from Kafka, writes to Cassandra, and then it does some business logic as well and parses the data. right? And then we have a query service written in Java for now that uh, queries Cassandra. Um, and uh, yeah, so you could have customer apps that are querying our query service written in Java, or you could have an ingestion app that also is, uh, or an edge device that's ingesting data. And so yeah, mainly what we're going to talk about today is the pipeline component and how, that, how we uh, worked that out. So a little bit of fun facts about the Java version. So it's a stateful Java app. Um, it runs on top of... Uh, Apache Apex, and which is basically deployed to a Hadoop cluster. So it runs uh, uh, HDFS and HBase, and it's a uh, pretty bulky deployment. Um, currently, our largest deployment right now is uh, 150 Cassandra nodes and 30 Kafka nodes. That's not too crazy for that, but that's our largest deployment for our, uh, for our cluster. And then we had 144 Apache Apex containers. And so with that deployment, we were getting about 900,000 writes per second peak. Um, so that was like the highest load we were getting for that. Um, but then with the Go version, it's just a stateless Go app. Um, we haven't deployed it to all of our production environments yet because we have nine of them and we're trying to slowly re uh, push this out. But we've pushed it to a smaller production environment that's nine Cassandra nodes and four Kafka nodes. And we only have 32 instances of the pipeline running and we were able to get uh, 450,000 writes per second, which is half of the peak load of the Java version, but with a much smaller cluster, about probably a tenth of the cluster size in terms of Cassandra nodes, which is our, the main bottleneck is uh, Cassandra writes. So um, much smaller cluster, but we're seeing really good results. Um, so here are the kind of numbers punched up against each other. We're seeing about, um, we're hoping to get about 1.8 million writes per second with a full size cluster that we were seeing. So that's hopefully twice as much as the old Java version. Um, and mainly it's because of Go's awesome concurrency and the worker pool model that we started to use. Um, 
And yeah, so we're going to talk a little bit about that today. So yeah, a little bit about the rewrite motivations. So it actually wasn't really about performance. It was more so about operational cost. It's extremely expensive to operate a Hadoop cluster, especially if you don't really need to. Uh, having, having, uh, having to manage that just to parse data points and write them to Cassandra was way overkill for our original architecture. So we had an arch architectural decision to kind of move to a stateless app that was much more lightweight. Uh, this, the state is stored in Kafka, right? So you don't really need uh, you don't really need a stateful HDFS processing system for for that if you if you're backed by Kafka. Um, because if you if your pipeline if your uh, if your pipeline goes down while it's processing the actual data, you could just not mark the offset to Kafka, and then you can replay that message uh, later on or retry. So. Yeah, so we're also moving more towards a Kubernetes model. So it's just a simple Go microservice, and we love Go. So we figured we'd rewrite it in Go. Um, so yeah, just a little bit about what data pipelines are. So at a high level, it's basically moving data from one system to another, and then also doing some business logic and transformations on top of that. So you might have something like Kafka, where all of your messages from your platform go into Kafka. Maybe it's chat messages or sensor data or anything like that. And you could have a microservice or whatever, uh, another service, just parse it and write it to Cassandra. So that's kind of what our model is for ours. Or you could have something like Kafka, and you read it from Storm, send it to, over to Nats, which sends it to something else. Obviously, microservices architecture can get quite large. Um, so yeah, so it's basically something like that. Um, and yeah, we're going to talk a little bit about Cassandra and Kafka to kind of uh, give you a high-level overview uh, just before we deep dive into how we're going to use them. So Kafka, for those that aren't aware, it's a published subscribe messaging system uh, parallelized with topic partitions. So if you want more throughput, you have more nodes and more partitions. Uh, it's very widely used. It's probably one of the most widely used messaging systems out there. It's very well trusted. A lot of different companies use it. Um, open source, you can check out the code there if you want. And a little bit about our partitions work. So um, you could have one topic that has, say, four partitions, and then you could have four subscribers listening to each one of those partitions. Or you could have something like two, two subscribers listening to four partitions, and the messages get sent and replicated to different partitions. So using Kafka with Go isn't so straightforward, unfortunately. There's a lot of different libraries you can choose from. Um, we chose Sarama and Sarama Cluster, because at the time, in 2015, it was the most mature library. And we've, since then, we've built a lot of like, internal tooling around it and documentation and onboarded all of our members to start using it. Um, we also chose it because there's no CGO dependency. The, the Kafka and Kafka Go actually is a CGO library, so we chose to not use that, um, just because we prefer to use all the, the tooling that um, sometimes CGO can be, uh, prevent you from doing that. Um, and yeah, so pick what, works, pick what works best for you. There's also a newer library from Segment.io uh, called Kafka Go. Started in June 2017. That one's looking pretty promising, so maybe take a look at that or contribute to it if you're interested. Uh, uh, Cassandra with Go is a lot more straightforward. There's Go SQL, which is the officially supported library. So if you want to start using Cassandra with Go, you just go and download Go SQL or go get it. Um, and then there's also Go SQL X on top of that. Um, but yeah, because what Cassandra is, is it's a fault-tolerant replicated uh, column or data store. Uh, it's very scalable. So for example, you can have over 75,000 nodes. Apple has over 75,000 nodes with 10 petabytes of data. Uh, Netflix has 2,500 nodes with 420 terabytes. So obviously, very scalable database. Um, and if those are kind of, you need a scalable database, then Cassandra is definitely a good pick for that. So yeah, Go and Cassandra, like I said, it's very straightforward. Uh, Go SQL is the main library that everyone uses. And then for high performance data bindings on top of that, you can use Go SQL X by the folks at SillaDB. So now we're going to talk real quickly about a sample data pipeline written in Go. So we're pretty much going to go over a real simple example. And this example is very similar to the production code that we're using at GE to parse all of those data points that I mentioned. By show of hands, who likes the Go Gopher? OK, that's what I thought. 
So I bring to you Gophers R Us. It's a store where you can go and buy any type of Gopher swag, t-shirts, anything you want. So we're going to build a data pipeline for Gophers R Us. So uh, example, uh, you can have a whole bunch of different sensor data, uh, Gopher sales data, log data. All of this highly important data needs to come into the Gophers R Us data pipeline. So let's say we want to focus on uh, just sensor data and log data now. Let's just send all of that data to Kafka, uh, publish all of the Gopher sales data, sensor data, log data to Kafka, and then we can kind of parse this data as we please. So we're going to have a transformation app similar to the, the pipeline that we built, and it's going to be subscribing from that Kafka topic, and then it's going to write to Cassandra. So pretty much what our pipeline does, just uh, um, instead for Gophers RS. So, what we're going to focus on is specifically the piece of reading from Kafka and writing to Cassandra. So it's a very simplified application flow. So when you are using Sarama cluster, you get a consumer object. And on, site, on top of that consumer uh, struct, you can, have, you can get messages. So that's a read-only channel. And you can read messages as they come into the channel. So basically, any time a message comes into that Kafka topic, it'll be uh, listened to. And you get that message. You send that off to the transform function, uh, which it returns you an event. And then you can write that event to Cassandra. So a very simple three steps. Read from Kafka, do any business transformations, and then write to Cassandra. So let's talk a little bit first about reading from Kafka. So there are three main channels for the Strama cluster library that you're going to that you're going to want to listen to when you start subscribing to your Kafka topic. So you have the messages channel. That's just the read-only channel where all of the raw data from your Kafka topic is coming from. Then you have the notifications channel. This channel is actually all the rebalanced notifications. So if a topic has re rebalanced or anything, then um, those, no those notifications come in there. And then there's an errors channel. And these are all the errors that happen with offset management. So if you uh, fail to mark an offset or anything, that will come to that channel. Um, so next, let's talk about transformation. So it's very simple. Uh, you just read from the messages channel up top, and you get the raw data from Kafka, right? So then we pass that down to our transform uh, function, and we're going to get into that one real quickly. So yeah, the transform, basically, you get a store event, and then you can unmarshal that raw data that we were reading from Kafka into our event struct. Right? So the event struct could be anything. You could have any type of data that you want. Um, and then let's say we want to assign a department to the, to the message as it's coming in. Because this could be any sort of data coming in. It could be, you know, let's say someone buys a gopher, a gopher t-shirt, or anything. So we want to assign what department from, of our store they actually bought this, uh, this item from. So, Assigned department, it could be a gopher, a sticker, a t-shirt, et cetera. So obviously, very important business logic. It's good that this is a resilient data pipeline, or else all of this data could be lost. We wouldn't want that. Um, next, we're going to talk real quickly about writing to Cassandra. So, so yeah, it's pretty straightforward, actually. Um, writing to Cassandra, all you need to do is pretty much you have a um, a prepared statement, and you have your columns, and then you basically do data bindings with GoSQLX. You do a GoSQLX query, and that binds all of your, it binds your statement to all of the uh, struct elements of the event type. So this is event.item name, event.price, and event.item department. And then we execute that query, and we return the error back upstream. So this is another side note about um, pretty much any Go app that um, you're building or any microservice in Go. Um, if you are kind of have like a long-lived application, it's, it's good to listen on the OS signals and be able to terminate your application gracefully. So specifically, what you can do is you can set up a channel. And what this channel does is it actually listens on OS signals that come into your application or service. So when you do like a Kubernetes kill your pod or a Cloud Foundry stop application or anything like that, um, or most platforms out there will send this uh, signal. It's called sig term. And that signal gets sent into your uh, service. 
Uh, for Kubernetes, by default, it'll wait 30 seconds, and then it'll kill your container. But basically, what you can do is you can have your application listen for this signal. And right when you receive a signal, SIG term, you can gracefully close your application. So this includes things like, for us, would be closing, basically stop reading from Kafka, um, close our Cassandra connection, all of that, right? So you can think of how you could use this for your application if it's uh, hosted on uh, Kubernetes or anything. But it's a really good way to basically gracefully close your service instead of just OS exiting. Uh, deploying to Kubernetes is pretty straightforward with this. You can just have a simple uh, uh, template right here to basically deploy this and however many replicas you want. Um, I'm not going to get too into depth on that because I uh, don't have the time for it. But next, let's get into reliability testing. So um, I think we all know that systems fail all the time. So uh, basically, how can we predict that our pipeline, how can we predict the behavior <laughs> that will happen from our data pipeline uh, when it fails? And how can we remedy these failures, right? Because if we know these are going to happen, we should have ways to remedy these failures instead of just you know, waking up in the middle of the night and having to fix it or push a, push a hot fix out in the middle of the night, which is never fun. Um, and how can we ensure our customer data is not lost when these failures happen? Because uh, since these failures, we know they're going to happen. We know Cassandra node might go down. We know Kafka node might go down. There might be a connectivity issue between your subnets or VPCs. Um, this does happen, and we need to be able to write tests that can simulate it and then also react upon it. So uh, we need to embrace failure scenarios, or else they will embrace you at 3 AM. Um, and if this kind of topic interests you, I'd recommend the SRE book from Google. Um, you can get it there. There's also a Google SRE workbook that's free for download until August 23rd. Um, so I'd recommend that as well if this kind of stuff interests you. So let's talk about our data pipeline that we just wrote for Govers R Us. What can actually happen to that data pipeline? What can fail? So data pipeline nodes could go down. Kafka nodes could go down. Cassandra nodes. Kubernetes could just fail, uh, could go down. Um, so basically, how does our pipeline behave when this happens? So in order to answer that question, we need to write a test. And basically, how can we remedy these failures? So here's a reliability test example that we use to integration test and simulate Cassandra nodes going down. So what you basically do is you have an initial count for your Cassandra, uh, for your Cassandra key space that you're reading from in your table. Um, so let's say, you want, let's say you want to ingest 50 messages to this pipeline. And at the end of the test, we want to ensure that all 50 successfully made it to Cassandra and were written to Cassandra. So what we're going to do is, once a second, we're going to write these messages to Cassandra. And uh, or, sorry, we're going, to write, we're going to send these messages to our pipeline and Cassandra. They should be written to Cassandra. So what we do is every, every uh, iteration in the loop, we push one message to our topic. Now, the pipeline should be reading from this topic and writing to Cassandra, right? But since we're writing every once a second, uh, we can keep on doing that, keep on doing that. And then at the 10th second, what we're going to do is pause Cassandra. So after 10 messages have been ingested, we're going to pause Cassandra. It's basically like killing Cassandra. So we have a little function, pause Docker image, takes in Cassandra. Literally, what that's doing is it's piping the command to, to CLI, uh, Docker, pause Cassandra. Um, so then we operate for the next 20 seconds, ingesting more messages with Cassandra being down. So the messages are still coming into Kafka, but Cassandra's down. After the 30th second, we unpause the Cassandra Docker uh, container, and it starts back up again. Now, ideally, all of the messages should still be ingested at the end of the 50 seconds because we have a resilient data pipeline. It's, it's, has, it's backed by Kafka. Um, so at the end of all of this ingestion, we check the final count of our key space and our item table. And then we make sure that there are 50 messages actually ingested. Right? So you could use this for any of your systems out there to integration test your system and make sure that it actually behaves the way you want it to when failures occur. So that was just one example, but what else could we test? We could test partial cluster failures. We could test full cluster failures. 
You could bring down the entire Cassandra cluster. You could bring down your pipeline and see how that behaves. You could do high load testing or anything like that. So that's why I'd recommend uh, integration testing with Docker when you can. Um, probably not in like all, all the time for all your local tests, but for at least for through CI or daily or something to make sure that your system does behave the way uh, the way it should with external dependencies. So next, we're just going to quickly go over some results and takeaways. So yeah, so building your data pipeline in Go, it's simple to get a small app up and running. Um, it's also good enough community support for Kafka, Cassandra, uh, to build data pipelines in Go. Um, you can use the signals channel for graceful shutdowns. It's really a nice thing to use for pretty much anything if you're writing it in Go. Uh, you can do reliability testing with Docker to integration and or reliability test your system. And then you can also understand how your system behaves during these failure scenarios, right? Because it's really important to understand when those happen before they happen in the middle of the night and you get paged. Um, and yeah, we replaced our Java pipeline for a lower, much lower operational cost uh, for simplicity and for performance. So that's it. Thanks.